Right, today's video is going to go into how I'm making uh, my slip casting moulds in a little bit more detail. Um, and this particular mould is the cast of the test tiles in the shape of uh, a moai, which is the Easter Island head. And so there's a blog post associated with this. <laughs> Sorry, there's going to be a small amount of chainsawing, there's some tree felling going on next door, um, which I was hoping would be finished by the time I started recording this, and it isn't, uh, which is annoying because this was the one time this week that I was likely to have enough time to record this. So I'm going to persevere. Hopefully the fact they're a distance away makes this listenable too. Um, if not, I'll just re-record. So there's a blog post associated with this that goes into some detail as well um, about how I made these moulds and why I'm not going to continue using these moulds. Um, and I'll explain that at the end. The first thing I'm going to do is cast. So when, if you're unfamiliar with slip casting, the way it works is I have liquid slip, and this is liquid casting slip, which is different from normal slip in that um, it's got so little water in it, if it didn't have a deflocculant, it would be basically throwable clay, it's somewhere approaching that. But you can add the deflocculant, which makes it really runny without adding much water which is how this works. If you try to do this with just watered down clay, um, it would take years to cast. But the way that it works is this is plaster. There's a hollow in the middle of the plaster. The plaster sucks the moisture out of the clay from the outside in, meaning you're left with a hollow shape um, in the shape of the cavity with a thickness dependent on the time you cast for. This is a casting slip I have made myself from my anthracite throwable clay um, and I have made the mould myself. What I'm going to do is start the cast, start a timer and then explain how I made the mould and I reckon it will be about as long to explain it as it is to cast it and I'll show you how I um, demould as well. So I'm just using a syringe because it's not a huge amount of slip for these. Um, this only works on things that are small enough that you can pour it like that, but um, works well for these. So, put the slip in. Um, something I saw uh, Van Tiki do, which is cover the top of, actually that's not the right one. Uh, that's one. And it stops the top of the slip from drying out. Um, right, so how I made this mould. So I did a quick video before showing the original monolith textile mould. It's a two part mould, as this one is um, designed to make these little monoliths, which are designed to effectively displace these little, um, well, they're they're little 50mm beakers, but I use them for case tests. Um, this is done the way that Kurt Hamley does his moulds, where you print, 3D print, the positive shape you want your mould to be. Then you cast around it in silicon, so you've got silicon on five edges, um, and then you remove it, and then you fill the space that's left with plaster, and that makes a plaster duplicate of the 3D print. So you 3D print the shape you want your mould to be and then you invert it, invert it again to get back to the plaster shape and then the hollow space that's left in the middle is what you want. So in this particular case, this is a, an old one of the moulds that it produces, but you get that monolith shape is what's left in the middle and so by pouring slip in there you get the uh, positive of that. So that's basically the way that works. Now, the reason that I'm not doing them all like this is because silicon's expensive. This is about 50, 60 pounds worth of silicon, um, and it's by far and away the most expensive part of this setup. Um, and I don't think it's necessary, bearing in mind, if you look at this, this wall, this wall, and this wall are doing almost nothing. They are giving you part of the key, but they're essentially not. So on that basis, 
could you do just this flat surface at the bottom? So, the Moai, what I did was I printed the face that I wanted to cast, but I then, rather than dropping down like you would if you were making literally the shape you wanted the plaster to be, I brought the walls up. So there's now a hollow chamber with that printable face on. That means I could make from it just a slab of silicon that had the, all the face information on. So that just basically comes out like that. So now you put that on a surface, you put plaster above it, you've got your keys, you've got your, uh, the relevant information for the piece you want to make, um, but you don't have the walls of the plaster. So this uses about 15%, maybe 20% of the, the silicon. So it's significantly cheaper. This is under 10 pounds worth. So when you're prototyping, this is far more viable if you have to do a f couple of iterations you'll spend tens of pounds rather than hundreds of pounds in silicon. Um, what it does mean is that you then have to build a framework for it to sit in so that you can cast the plaster. So I did this two part, this is all held together. You want a solid base plate. Um, I realize I never started a timer for that. Never mind. I can use the camera timer. Um, solid base plate because you don't want to be stressing the silicon because you can see if you were to stress it, um, if you watch, it's not too difficult to distort it. And if it distorts the keys, the keys aren't going to line up. If they're not distorted, all you've got to do is trim any excess plaster that would interfere with the two bits of plaster meeting. And you can have a perfectly good plaster cast, um, even though it's, um, there might be a little gap down the side. So that's the way I did it. These are just bits of uh, expanded PVC and I've hot glue gunned them together in two parts. So I just have to tape around that to hold it in place then I can cast the plaster from that. And that's how I cast those. So does it work? Yes, it's not probably as good. Um, certainly not if you're going to be a production potter or just um, production casting rather. Um, and the reason for that is that there's more cleanup. There's more faff every time you want to set this one up, you've got to clean the edges, reattach it. And then when you cast it, you get little bits where the plaster's gone down the side. You know, the edges aren't so neat. So you do need to do more cleanup on these. And the thing with casting lots of molds is that obviously you do one silicon one, and then you do however many molds. You could do a hundred if you were a proper production potter, like I, I don't know how many Kurt gets out of each one of his silicon molds, but it probably is hundreds, which means that it's worth putting more time into the silicon if that's what you're doing, um, rather than into the plaster, because obviously every single time you do a plaster duplicate, you're spending more time this way. So there is a definite advantage to having this, and this does five edges of your plaster really neatly. You can add I didn't for this they're all sharp edges but if you wanted to you can round every single edge um, even down to this one I trimmed back badly which I wish I hadn't done um, but instead of doing that you can actually design your mold so that you have that lip as well so you can get perfect uh, plaster duplicates this way which you can't my way but the advantage is that obviously you can prototype better my way um, <coughs> and then a couple of other things that I've done. Here is one that's going to make a peacock eye bowl, and it does. Is there anything here actually in focus? Should be. Maybe the camera's not showing it properly. But um, this is just an, again another test because this has none of the key walls, but essentially what you get is you can just drop that because the silicon is dense, denser than plaster. You can just drop that to the bottom of any container. So I just used. Like this is, I can't remember what the container is for, but it's just, you know, a weird shaped container, but it had a flat bottom. So you can drop that to the bottom and you can see how that fits in that gap. And then there's this extra lip that doesn't do anything. Um, that's just the size of the container. If you've got a better fit for a container, great. But um, the important thing is that it make, lets you make a bowl mold, which 
if you tried to cast around the outside, this in silicon would use a huge amount of silicon, but I've done it with just essentially filling a bowl with the silicon. So much cheaper. Um, and then this one makes, uh, I need to show you. They're little things that I'm using to make fridge magnets. So um, what I did was, this one was done the kind of the more old fashioned way. I printed the positive shape of it, cast the whole thing in silicon, and now I fill that with plaster and I get, um, probably not quite dry enough, but I get these little things. And then I fill that chamber with slip and I get little personalized, well, my logo on them, uh, fridge magnets, which when you use casting slip for this, the shrinkage is minimal. If you use non-casting slip, they'll warp, which I have tried previously, and it doesn't work so well. But with casting slip, you just end up with flat little discs with your logo on, um, and they take you know, maybe 10 seconds to make once you've got to this stage. So they've gone <coughs> from being something that were was a bit of effort for me to make to something that I can just churn out now, which is quite nice because I like having them as free gifts to go out with orders, but I had this constant supply problem where they took enough time to roll out the clay or, or pour the clay on a slab or whatever. However I was doing it, it always took time. Um, and if you didn't get your stamp on at the right point, they didn't work very well. This way, really easy. So if you're looking for a fun project to start, this is a good one. And this one, you don't need anywhere near this much silicon. Literally that little disc in the middle would do. So what you could do is um, probably the easiest way if you wanted to do this without a 3D printer would be to make a an example uh, fridge magnet. So roll out a sheet of clay, cut a circle in it, put your logo in it, then cast that in plaster, then cast the plaster in silicon and then make duplicate plaster from that. Or if you're looking to get into 3D printing again, this is a very simple shape. You just make a cylinder and then put a smaller cylinder <coughs> reversed out of it to make that middle bit um, and then put your logo in it. Very, very easy to design as a first project. Um, yeah, works well. So all of that, and I'll put some pictures up now of how, or if I haven't already, of how the mower are looking. Um, I'm really pleased with how they're casting, um, but I won't be making any more of them after this month. So it's never really sat right with me. The reason I used the Moai design is because someone else had done an STL of it. So there's a downloadable 3D file that I could get um, for free. And it was already, per just through the virtue of the shape of them, was perfectly designed to be a two-part mould. If you split it down the centre, it just would come apart in a mould like that, which isn't true of most things. Most things you have to have some form of consideration for overhangs or whatever. The Moai design that this person had done didn't. So it was very simple to put it in a thing. I wanted to test this process, and obviously I already had the mother mould for my monoliths, so I needed a new design to make this worth testing because I was obviously going to be using silicon to do this. Um, I wanted something where the end result wasn't going to be the same. So why not use the Moai? I wasn't really expecting it to work. It did work and people were saying, could they buy them? Um, and, you know, it, I wasn't comfortable with that. But there is a charity. I'll link to, um, so there's a podcast called the uh, Fall of Civilizations, which is a fantastic podcast. And there's an episode on Rapa Nui, which is Easter Island, which is a fantastic episode and really interesting. If you've ever heard anything about the island, it's probably 50-50 on it being wrong. Um, and I would highly recommend going and listening to that anyway, even if, you know, you're not, you know, it's just a really good podcast. But the point of it is that there's a charity that works on Rapa Nui to preserve the culture um, and preserve the ecology and the remaining Moai that are, that are still on East Island. Um, and so I was giving all the money, basically I'm selling them for £2.50 each and all the money goes to that charity. But still, 
it still feels like cultural appropriation. Like there's no good reason for me to be making Moai. Even if the net result is that money goes to a charity that um, has something to do with the historical context of them, it still <clears throat> doesn't feel like I should be making them. And I know some people won't get that and some people will get that. And some people will think, you know, you shouldn't have done it in the first place. Um, and all of those are valid points because this is uh, very much a grey area of what is acceptable and what is not and what you're comfortable with and what you're not because, you know, it's a cultural icon, there's a historical context, there's a cultural context um, and I'm, you know, none of this is a judgement, you can feel what you feel one way or the other but um, I, uh, I'm not comfortable kind of making them and putting it out there publicly as a thing because you know then it's not my culture so I kind of knew I wasn't comfortable with it before and making no money well actually I make a loss on them because all the profits go to no like, and when I say profits I mean less postage so I'm I'm paying for the materials and all the firing and etc and then all the all the money uh, that I'm paid for them is going to charity even then it doesn't feel right to me so I'm not going to make any more after I've worn this mold out um, which will take a few more castings and again all that money is going to go to the um, Toka Rapa Nui uh, Foundation I'll link that in the description um, yeah it's a there's definitely a historical context that I wasn't even considering when I started this because I wasn't expecting it to work um, and this was just a very easy pre-existing model for me to test that was cool. Unfortunately they've worked so well that it seems like a shame that I feel this way but um, on the other hand as I get better at 3D modelling it's going to be more plausible that I would come up with my own design that would be cool. I'm not sure I'm quite at the point where I could do anything this good yet. Um, but in theory, any form of kind of quite geometric, uh, shapely things should cast interest or should glaze interestingly. And then the making them fit into a cast and work as a two piece casting is a, an interesting challenge. So this was a, a kind of lazy step on my part just so I could test the process and you know I've learned what I wanted to learn from it. Um, it's been an interesting project but I'm not going to be doing any more. However, if you are comfortable with it and you want to give this a go, uh, I have put the SDL for this and then the version where it projects downwards if you wanted to cast the whole thing in silicon. So if anyone has got a 3D printer and wants to try and make it themselves and is comfortable with that, you can. Or you can download it, look at it, see what I've done, and then just change that in a bit to whatever design you want. You know, if, if you're 3D printing and downloading STLs, you probably have some capacity to edit them. I'm just using Blender. Blender's free. So the limit is the ability to do it, which admittedly is quite limiting because um, 3D modeling is difficult, incredibly difficult. And it's coming from, you know, I was a graphic designer before, not that they ever taught us 3D modeling, but I mucked around with it at uni and used it in a few design projects. But it is um, a whole level above in difficulty what um, 2D static design is. Um, but yeah, so, that's how I'm making the moulds, that's why I made them the way I did, the pros and cons, and then why this particular mould has now been retired and won't be coming back out. But hopefully I'll come up with my own design, maybe similar, maybe something completely different, similar sort of size. Uh, and then obviously I have the monolith test tiles, which are actually designed as test tiles. So they're more applicable to what I'm trying to achieve with my test tiles. Um, but that's what I've been up to. Now, I think that is timing wise, actually it's not quite been long enough. So 
I'll just let this run for a minute. Or, let's see, is that anywhere near cast? No, that's a bit thin. So you can see it's starting to, you can see the, the wall thickness starting to build up there. Um, this top chamber works as a reservoir. So what I've got is, and you saw all the molds have that step or two steps on them. The first step is the foot. The second step is a reservoir that you can then uh, trim off basically to get a level foot. I'm sure that has a name, but I don't know what it is. Um, oh, and while well, I'm waiting for this to give it a few more minutes to finish casting, I'll talk about making your own casting slip from clay because um, in theory it's not too difficult. In reality, I was having a really hard time doing it. This is anthracite. Essentially, <coughs> the way it works is you slake down dried trimmings, it's the easiest way. So the same way that I make my decorative slip, you just put your dry trimmings in a bucket, cover them with water, let them sit for a while till they're rehydrated and disintegrate. Uh, and then in theory, you just mix that up and add a deflocculant. So I'm using sodium silicate because I can't get Darvan in the UK. If you can get your hands on Darvan, which I know most of you are in the States and it's much easier to come by, there's a couple of variations and I think the higher the number, the better it is. But um, a few, Darvan is, along the same lines as sodium silicate, but with a few adjustments made so it works better. And I think the way it works better is it's more effective to so use less of it because the molds absorb the, the flocculant and that's what causes them to stop working properly. So when I say wear out a mold, I mean literally after a number of castings, a mold will stop casting well. And it's as it starts to become saturated with the deflocculant uh, and using Dava means you can use less, so the molds last longer and it damages them less. Um, but the difficulty is getting it worked through the clay. And I normally use cordless drill and this mixing attachment, which I really like for glaze, but it's just not beefy enough for slip, especially a thick, um, I mean, it's a very thick slip until it's deflocculated, it's basically solid. So <coughs> I bought myself a plaster mixer and you can see the comparison in the size of the mixer head for how much more serious a thing this is. Uh, and they're not expensive. So this was about 60 pounds. It's, uh, I think it's 850 watt, something on that sort of ballpark. Um, I'll link to the one that I got, and the reason I got this one particularly is just down to one factor, and that is that the handles on most of them are plastic and attached, as far as I can tell. This one has a wire handle that bolts. So there's um, two mounting points, one there, one there. Meaning, if you wanted to wall mount this or make a stand for it, you can just undo those two bolts take this handle off and then make your own plate to attach this to, and then you've got fixed. It doesn't lock on, unfortunately. I thought it did from the description. There's no kind of lock to hold it on, but it's got variable speed, and in theory you could just adjust the handle, adjust the, the tension to um, adjust the speed. So you can leave this set up and running without having to hold it, which will be very useful uh, because you want to spend a bit of time mixing it. But the difference between this and the cordless is day and night in terms of how quickly it mixes stuff up. Unsurprisingly, this is very powerful with a huge mixing attachment, but um, it will turn the slaked clay into a pretty smooth slip in a couple of seconds and it will just comfortably work its way through putting a deflocculant in and turning that into liquid and working it evenly throughout the clay. Um, it doesn't even struggle. You can run it for a couple of minutes and you get essentially casting clay, casting slip. So if you have, like I do, 
buckets and buckets and buckets of trimmings and want something to do with them, um, I would highly recommend one of those and it's cheap for what it is. I mean, for a bit of studio equipment that can do what it can do, um, even if you're just doing reclaim, I'd recommend one because if you're reclaiming buckets and then you want to mix them through and get them onto a wedging board and smooth it all out, a couple of minutes with one of those, you'll get perfectly, well, not perfectly, but pretty close to sieved quality of slip, which you can then put out onto a plaster bat. And when it's um, when it's dried, you'd have a really nice consistency versus the kind of the more lumpy nature of just slaked and dried clay. So I'll link to that one. Um, again, nothing special by any of the others, unless you want to wall mount it, in which case look for one that has that handle. I haven't actually got any of the others. Maybe the plastic handles can be taken apart and have the same setup, I don't know. But that's the reason I picked that one. And that's something I intend to do if I do continue slip casting more generally. So I reckon the wall thickness is about right now. So what you can do is you just tip it up. Um, in theory, different molds will want to, um, the more complicated the the hollow inside them, the more it matters how you demold them or um, demold them, but like get the slip out. Uh, these are very straightforward, so you just literally tip it up and let it drain for a bit, um, which I will do now. And then we will, I've said everything I can think of, so we will jump forward in time to when I trim off the excess. Right, next step. This is about an hour later. I need to trim the excess off out of the reservoir. Now for that, on these small ones, I use this little plastic tool. I got it as part of a set of those cheap pottery tools you can get. Um, I'm not really sure what you'd have to search to find one if you wanted to, but they're you know, cheap plastic tools. This is the sort of scrapery thing. Um, and it's perfect because it's a blade that cuts away from you. So when you see people demold, um, trim off bigger molds, they often use ribs or knives, which are great for kind of coming in sideways, but not so easy when you've got a small thing like this. Whereas this, I can just cut in and then turn it around and it peels off like that. And you can see the wall thickness now, which is a little thinner than I would have ideally gone for, but um, it will do for test tiles. Um, you just need to kind of be aware of the thickness. So that's that. And I suspect these are probably Somewhere, because they're so thin, they'll dry quite quickly. Somewhere approaching dry enough to just properly demold. So let's see if I can open it. Would save coming back and doing another video. There's a bit of give, yeah. Oh, it's doing the thing. It seems to quite like doing this. So there's um, obviously something that catches on one half. So it generally goes that way around. It leaves half in each mould. Uh, let's adjust the camera so you can see them. So what you've got is because these don't fit together perfectly and because this slip is quite runny, you get um, a little bit of spill out. The good thing is, as they dry, um, you can sort of start to see it at that tip there. It cracks away from it. So it actually almost cleans itself as it comes out. Um, I don't know if they'll be dry enough to completely release. Ah, here they are. So that's how they come out. Uh, as I say, if I left it in there a bit longer it would have all snapped off like that top part has uh, on its own which um, works quite well but then because it's so thin you can just break it off a bit like a an airfix model or something like that and 
that is what you get. So um, that's pretty much it. The, the final cleanup I use, uh, I quite like the diamond core trimming tools, uh, but any loop tool would work. Uh, and I just run it along the seam once it's a bit drier, scrape it back and then sponge the bottom smooth, but you've, you've got a, a flat solid base to it. So all in all, really happy with how the molds function. Um, I'm going to try this again, obviously with um, a design that's more my own. Um, but yeah, if you want to give it a go, uh, basically it's all it needs in Blender is you put your, uh, well, no, I, I can't. I was going to start trying to explain Blender. I can't explain Blender to you. What I would say, if you're interested in learning Blender specifically for this sort of thing, I'll put a link to the course. There's a guy uh, called Jonathan uh, with his YouTube channels, Maker Tales. He's started a course specifically teaching Blender for 3D printing. I'll put um, a link up to that. I'm doing it at the moment. Um, but his videos on YouTube are great. If you look up precision modeling in Blender, that's what I was using. Uh, and now he's got one that specifically works you all the way through from total beginner to 3D printing in Blender. So if you're interested in this, that's a great reference. Um, and if you're interested, if you can use Blender, the logic with these is basically split your model in half, put half face in one way, a set distance from the midpoint, and then the flip it over and have it the same distance in the other direction. And what you end up with is a mold that backs itself. So you only need one mold that makes two identical pieces. That's how I'm doing these. Um, saves on the silicon. Um, sometimes you can't do it because you can't fit two up of a bigger piece on a mold and then print it. Um, at least not on my printer, but on a bigger printer you would be able to. And it's quite nice being able to cast two things at once from one mould because you halve the effort for the casting part. Obviously it does mean that you have to make two mould parts for each mould where if they were different you'd be able to cast them as at once because you'd have had to make two versions of this. So you'd have two silicon mothers, one for each half. This way you only get one silicon mother, so they take twice as many rounds of plaster but um the upside is that they're interchangeable so that's pretty much it i think um can't think of much else to say about them any questions leave them in the comments i'll do my best to answer um but this is all still fairly new to me i'm i'm beginning to get the hang of it but what I'm finding with slip casting is as soon as you start to get the hang of it, it'll do something different. There's a thousand different ways for it to not work. Um, and a lot of little tricks that you will pick up as you find all the ways that it doesn't work. But um, yeah, it's been fun, if nothing else. I've been enjoying the project. Um, yeah, let me know if you've got any questions.